a client met his banker to discuss opening a restaurant in a busy airport. In us, he found a partner that understood the importance of reaching for the sky. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 37, for broadcast on the 11th of May, 2018. Coming up on Space Time, Earth's magnetic field, unlikely to flip anytime soon, the killer asteroid hunter releases its fourth year of observations, and the runaway star found in the small Magellanic Cloud. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study of the most recent near reversals of Earth's magnetic field has concluded that a total polarity reversal isn't likely to occur in the near future. There's been continuing speculation in scientific circles that Earth's geomagnetic field may be about to reverse due to a weakening of the magnetic field over the last 200 years, combined with an expansion of an identified weak area in the magnetic field known as the South Atlantic Anomaly, which stretches from Chile and Argentina across the South Atlantic Ocean into Southern Africa, ending at Zimbabwe. However, a new study reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences examined observations of the geomagnetic field involving the two most recent geomagnetic excursion events, the Last Champ, which occurred approximately 41,000 years ago, and Mono Lake, which happened about 34,000 years ago. In both cases, the planet's magnetic field came close to reversing, but recovered its original structure. Scientists can reconstruct changes in Earth's magnetic field through history using paleomagnetic data from sedimentary cores and volcanic rocks across the globe. Magnetic minerals inside rocks and sediments record the orientation and strength of Earth's magnetic field at the time of the rock's formation. The models reveal magnetic field structures comparable with the current geomagnetic field at both Last Champ and Lake Mono, approximately 49,000 and 46,000 years ago, with an intensity structure similar to but much stronger than today's South Atlantic anomaly. Their timing and severity were confirmed by records of cosmogenic nucleides, rare isotopes created when high-energy cosmic rays interact with the nucleus of an in-situ solar system atom, causing nucleons, that is the protons and neutrons in the nucleus of an atom, to be expelled from the atom through a process known as spallation. However, neither of these South Atlantic anomaly-like fields developed into either a major excursion or a full reversal. One of the study's authors, Professor Richard Holm from the University of Liverpool, says despite continuing speculation that Earth's about to experience a major magnetic polar reversal or a lesser excursion event, closer examination of the two most recent excursion events show that neither bears resemblance to the current changes in the geomagnetic field, and it's therefore unlikely that such an event's about to happen. Instead, the research suggests that the current weakened magnetic field will recover without such an extreme event, and therefore unlikely to reverse. Earth's magnetic field serves as a shield against hazardous radiation from space, especially the Sun's charged particle flux. It also aids in human navigation, animal migrations, and protects telecommunications and satellite systems. The magnetic field is generated by a geodynamo deep in the planet's core. It's produced as the molten liquid metallic outer core of iron, nickel and other metals circulates around the solid metallic inner core, generating an electric current which in turn produces a magnetic field. The strength and structure of the magnetic field has varied at different times throughout geological history. At certain periods, the geomagnetic field has weakened to such an extent that it's able to swap the polarities of its northern and southern magnetic poles. Called a geomagnetic reversal, the last time such a change in polarity happened was around 780,000 years ago. However, geological records show that these reversals usually occur fairly randomly. For example, 72 million years ago, the planet's magnetic field reversed five times in the space of just a million years. While during a 4 million year period centered around 54 million years ago, there were 10 reversals. And around 42 million years ago, 17 reversals took place in the span of just 3 million years. These errors of frequent reversals have been counterbalanced by a few so-called supercrons, long periods when no reversals took place. However, geomagnetic excursions, where the magnetic field comes close to reversing but recovers its original structure, have occurred more recently. 
At the beginning of an excursion, the field shows a slightly different pattern of reduced magnetic strength across the Earth's surface. And since 1840, the year systematic measurements began, the global strength of the magnetic field has decayed at a rate of about 5% per century. Since that time, a significant anomaly of reduced magnetic strength has appeared over the South Atlantic, the so-called South Atlantic Anomaly, characterised by a significant reduction in the strength of Earth's magnetic field compared with areas at similar geographic latitudes. Here, protection from harmful radiation from space is reduced. In fact, the Van Allen radiation belts migrate closer to the planet's surface over the South Atlantic Anomaly. This leads to a higher rate of satellite communications blackouts and higher doses of radiation for passengers on long-distance airline flights. NASA shuts down the Hubble Space Telescope when its orbit takes it over the area, and computers on spacecraft have been known to crash. Scientists can't, however, say how long the South Atlantic anomaly is likely to persist. In fact, it's possible that the strength of the field in this area is likely to continue to decay for several centuries. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. NASA's Near-Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or NEOWISE, mission has just released its fourth year of survey data, showing it studied over 1,300 asteroids and comets that will pass close to Earth. Since its latest mission began in December 2013, and following a period of hibernation, the redesignated asteroid and comet hunter has completely scanned the skies nearly eight times, and has observed and characterised some 29,375 objects during its four years of operations, and has observed and characterised some 29,375 objects during its latest four years of operations. This total includes some 788 NEOs, or near-Earth objects, and 136 comets since the mission's restart. NEOs are comets or asteroids which will cross Earth's orbit or come awfully close to it. Ten of the objects discovered by NEO-wise in the past year have been classified as potentially hazardous asteroids, or PHAs, meaning there's a possibility that they may impact the Earth. NEOWISE Principal Investigator Amy Mainzer from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says NEOWISE has now characterised the sizes and reflectivities of over 1,300 near-Earth objects since the spacecraft was launched. She says the data will provide scientists with an invaluable resource for understanding the physical properties of this population, what they're made of and where they come from. The probes collected over 2.5 million images of the sky in the past year. When combined with the mission's past observations, the archive contains some 10.3 million sets of images and a database of more than 76 billion sources of detections extracted from those images. The mission was originally launched as the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE spacecraft, in December 2009. WISE was originally tasked with performing a survey of the infrared sky in four wavelength bands from Earth orbit. These allowed the spacecraft to observe stars and galaxies, detect thermal radiation from the internal heat sources of substellar objects like brown dwarfs, detect thermal radiation from asteroids, and detect cosmic dust in star-forming regions. The probe was placed into hibernation in 2011 after its primary astrophysics mission was completed when its infrared coolant supply became exhausted. But then, in September 2013, NASA reactivated the spacecraft and renamed it NEOWISE, assigning it to its new mission to identify and characterise near-Earth objects. NEOWISE is also characterising more distant populations of asteroids and comets in order to provide information about their sizes and compositions. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Okay, we all know that when it comes to conspiracy theories, those involving space are often some of the dumbest, consequently attracting the most gullible of people. And while the flat earthers, the moon hoaxers, and the face on Mars Fruit Loops continue to push their narratives regardless of the facts, the Nibiru cataclysm should have gone away after the fictitious planet failed to collide with Earth as those believing the tale had predicted. David Mead, a self-proclaimed Christian numerologist, whatever that is, predicted that Nibiru, an undiscovered planet, would collide with the Earth either on the 23rd of September 2017 or sometime during October of that year. Mead based his predictions on secret numerological codes in various passages of the Bible. 
He claimed these gave him the date of when the planet would suddenly appear and collide, or at least pass awfully close to the Earth. Needless to say, he was wrong. No real surprises there. Mead's pontifications were based on the idea first put forward in 1995 by another Fruit Loop by the name of Nancy Leader, who hosts a conspiracy theory website called Zeta Talk. Leader describes herself as a contactee with the ability to receive messages from extraterrestrials from the Zeta Reticuli star system through an alien implant in her brain. She claims she was chosen to warn mankind that an object, Nibiru, would sweep through the inner solar system in May 2003, causing the Earth to undergo a physical pole shift that would ultimately destroy most of humanity. Although that date was later postponed. Oops. Her failed prediction nevertheless spread far beyond her website and has been embraced by numerous internet doomsday groups. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr. Fred Watson, from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. We're going to uh, hone in on uh, one of the more popular myths, uh, particularly on the internet, that of the planet Nibiru, which a lot of people are convinced exists, but we've never seen it. It's on the opposite side of the sun. It's always in the opposite position to Earth, some theories believe. Uh, and yet there are so many people think that this is real, Fred. That's correct. And if you go on the web... Uh, I have, and it just... <laughs> it's you put the yeah. word in there and you just go... <laughs> the list is... I think it's longer than porn uh, oh. of all these oh. <laughs> all these sites dedicated to the planet Nibiru. So you can... I was going to say you can even find pictures of it, uh, which is pretty good considering it doesn't exist. Um, oh, no. But the most common picture that purports to be Nibiru is something that looks like a red star with a sort of brownish halo around it and a few other stars in the image. This is a very well-known image made with the Hubble telescope, but it doesn't show Nibiru. It shows an object called V838 Monocerotis, and that is a variable star. That's why it's called V. Uh, it's actually the 838th variable star in the constellation of Monoceros, the unicorn. And what you're seeing is, in fact, the light echo around it. This thing has outbursts of light Light, which light up the dust cloud around it. And we see those after the star itself has settled down because the light is taking a dog leg path to get to Earth. There you are. A quick a quick lecture on light echoes thrown into Nibiru. It is not oh, I, Nibiru. I, can, I can dispel one myth automatically. Apparently we were supposed to have been destroyed by Nibiru. That's right. And and I think uh, several years earlier, I think we've, we've mm. been threatened with destruction several times. Uh, so yeah. and any picture that you see of a, of a sort of slightly vaguely hairy looking brown thing with a red star at the middle <laughs> is actually not Nibiru. The, the other thing that staggers me about the stuff on the web is some of it looks so professionally done. It's clearly done by organisations that have somehow got a vested interest in peddling this myth and you know some very nice video simulations of orbits and things of that sort all of which is completely fictitious so where does the nibiru story come from it apparently goes back to 1995 and a woman in wisconsin in america her name is nancy leader she runs a website which is called zeta talk and that website i think is really where the origin of this story comes from apparently the zeta talk website if you read it you find that when she was a girl nancy leader received an implant in her brain from extraterrestrials who came from a, a star called zeta reticuli now re okay. uh, zeta is a star it's a star in the constellation of reticulus the square it is ridiculous. Yeah, that's ridiculous that's right <laughs> maybe that's where it comes from but apparently because of this <laughs> implant she's been talking to these people these extraterrestrials ever since and so zeta talk is her website where she communicates what she's learned from the extraterrestrials as you would do if you had something like yeah, that you know absolutely but there is a picture of nancy on the web she looks very homely and very pleasant but you don't see any evidence of a, an implant however the name itself doesn't come from nancy she apparently called her version of nibiru planet x which is a pretty good yes. name, really. Yeah. Well, there's been lots of Planet Xs. I think at one stage Pluto was a Planet X as well. The name itself actually harks back to the work of an Azerbaijani-American author whose name was Zechariah Sitchin. Zechariah uh, is also no longer with us. Born in 1920, died in 2010. He was an author who wrote kind of, I don't know what you might call it, factual science fiction, something that seemed to have its feet 
you know, um, feet in reality, but was actually fictional. And he postulated the existence of a planet that had an orbital period of 3,600 years, an intelligent inhabitant. So this is a planet going round the sun with this very, very long uh, period and a very elongated orbit. So it's got an orbit that a lot of the time it's way, way away from the sun, but uh, periodically comes in to the inner solar system, a bit like the orbits of comets. We know comets behave like that. Which would make it unlivable. Uh, it right? would, yeah, that's right. You'd have such mm. variations in uh, climate and things of that sort that, yeah, unlivable. But despite that, he postulated the existence of intelligent inhabitants who may or may not threaten us, whatever, and postulated the name Nibiru. So this whole legend or myth seems to be a jumble of two different ideas. And I have to say, Andrew, that this is in many ways where our science, astronomy and space science, leaves itself wide open to the conspiracy theorists because we always admit what we don't know. We say, well, we don't know about this. We've got inferences about this, that and the other, but we don't know. One of the things that hasn't helped with the Nibiru story is Planet Nine. I was about yeah. to bring that up. I told you I had a question and we did talk about Planet Nine last yeah. year. It has been making the news on and off for a little while now because there is a common belief that there may well be a planet nine and mathematically yes. could uh, exist so yeah that kind of messes the whole deep <laughs> that's up a right bit. but it's <laughs> definitely not nibiru um so planet nine just no. to recap is something that's been postulated again a long way from the sun but a, a planet of the solar system probably if i remember rightly a couple of hundred times further away than the earth is from the sun so you know maybe 10 times further than neptune which would make it very faint and very difficult to observe and the reason why it's been mm. suggested is because when we look at the orbits of what are called trans-Neptunian objects, these icy asteroids way out beyond the orbit of Neptune. Those orbits kind of line up in an unusual way. And it's those alignments that suggest that they're being gravitationally disturbed by something relatively massive out at of this very great distance. So a number of astronomers in the US have postulated that. And indeed, there is work going on to try and find Planet Nine. However, However it's not to be <laughs> if we if we do have evidence of a planet nine because of the um, orbital disturbances and gravitational pull that, that seems to exist, would not the same effect be detectable with supposedly Nibiru? Well, that, yes. I mean, the, the thing, what's happened, it's no, nowhere near as, as cogent as that, Andrew. The, the Nibiru oh. story has got completely tied up with the Planet Nine story. Nibiru is supposed to hide behind the sun. That's the theory, as you mentioned yes. at the beginning. Now, orbital mechanics simply do not allow that to happen. Gravitational forces disturb things in ways that are very predictable and we understand all that stuff. There was a lovely quote from uh, Brian Cox, which um, I'll proceed with a, a slight language warning here. Um, he says, <laughs> if anybody else asks me about Nibiru, the imaginary bullshit planet, I will slap them around their irrational heads with Newton's Principia. And that's delivered with an accent very similar to Brian's because he came from Oldham, which is just <laughs> over the border from Yorkshire where I lived. <laughs> So, yeah, Brian, Brian's got fed up about, of answering questions about me. I don't <laughs> blame him, to be honest. Yeah. I don't blame him. But uh, it, it goes on and on and on, Fred. And, and, and I, I don't think that um, our attempt to debunk it today is going to make it go away as much as yeah, we'd like right. it to. Um, I, I'm sure you're right. There are people who know far better than we do about things like this, Andrew. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. Um, but... You know, um, who knows what the next big myth will be? There's, there's always going to be one. Uh, whenever you're sort of boldly going where no one's gone before and finding things unusual, you're going to also find people writing weird and wonderful stories. Of exactly. And, you know, or, if, or we, if we astronomers were not highly upstanding ethical people, we could have a ball because there's so much in <laughs> astronomy, you know. that yeah, I, I refer to the... Uh, <laughs> story previously that was published yeah, exactly. about all the unicorns and exactly everything. we could we could have a ball um mm. but we refrain from doing that <laughs> mainly because we're yes, upstanding yes, ethical people plus we can't see any way of making money out of it that's dr fred watson from the australian astronomical observatory speaking with andrew dunkley on our sister program space nuts and this is space time i'm Stuart gary mm. 
Astronomers have discovered a rare yellow supergiant runaway star speeding across its host galaxy at some 482,803 kilometres per hour, fast enough to travel from Sydney to Perth, or if you prefer, from New York to Los Angeles, in just 30 seconds. A runaway star, designated J01020100-7122208, was detected in the small Magellanic Cloud, a dwarf galaxy located about 200,000 light years away and thought to be a satellite orbiting our own Milky Way galaxy. The yellow supergiant has about 200 times the radius of the Sun. The runaway star is thought to have once been part of a binary system. When the companion star exploded as a supernova, the tremendous release of energy flung the yellow supergiant into space at high speed. It's the first runaway yellow supergiant star ever discovered, and only the second evolved runaway star to be found in another galaxy. After 10 million years of travelling through space, this star evolved into a yellow supergiant, the object that we see today. Its journey's taken it some 1.6 degrees across the sky, which from here on Earth looks like about three times the diameter of the full moon and the star will continue speeding through space until it too blows up as a supernova, probably in another 3 million years or so. Yellow supergiants are rare because the yellow supergiant phase is so short. Massive stars may live for as much as 10 million years, but the yellow supergiant phase probably only lasts between 10 and 100,000 years, a blink of an eye in the life of a star. After this short time, yellow supergiants will expand into bloated red supergiants, like Betelgeuse, better known to many of us as Betelgeuse. That expansion will cause the star to become a true giant. If placed where the Sun is at the centre of our solar system, its diameter would extend beyond the orbit of Mars, maybe even Jupiter. Eventually the star will die, in this spectacular core collapse supernova, briefly outshining the entire small Magellanic Cloud. When that happens, heavier elements will be created and the resulting supernova remnant will form new stars and planets on the outer edge of the small Magellanic Cloud, which in a few tens of billion years' time will probably be absorbed into the Milky Way, although by then the Milky Way itself will have merged with the even bigger Andromeda galaxy. The pole star Polaris is a yellow supergiant, as is Canopus, one of the brightest stars visible from the southern skies. The yellow supergiant was discovered by Catherine Nugent from the Lowell Observatory and reported in the Astronomical Journal. The discovery was made using the National Optical Astronomy Observatory's 4-metre Blanco Telescope and the Carnegie Observatory's 6.5-metre Magellan Telescope, both located in northern Chile. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. China has used its new Long March 11 rocket to launch five remote sensing satellites. The 21-metre tall rocket blasted off from the Jiaquan Satellite Launch Centre in northwestern China. The mission was the second launch this year of the new solid-fueled Long March 11 rocket and the fourth launch since its introduction in 2015, marking the Long March 11's transition from test flights to operational service. Payload for the mission was Zhaohai-1, a constellation of five commercial remote sensing satellites. The spacecraft are equipped with a variety of hyperspectral and high-resolution video technology to study surface agriculture, land and water resources, environmental activity and transport. The mission was China's 12th orbital launch this year. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.